plan was for three of us to meet at Gordon's house before daylight on Saturday, then take one vehicle to the McGeorge Stick Pond. It was 1968, and my friend Gordon Bridges, a farmer who lived in the county in a wide place in the road named Cornerstone, Arkansas, an hour and hour ago, an insurance agent who lived in Little Rock had invited me to go fishing with him. I lived in Pine Bluff. The McGeorge family of Pine Bluff has extensive farming interests around Cornerstone, and their stick pond is a dead timber reservoir of about 400 acres. I had heard about it all my life, but had never seen it. Supposedly, the fishing for largemouth bass was outstanding. Needless to say, I was pumped at the prospect of fishing a primo spot. I arrived at Gordon's house about 10 minutes ahead of the agreed upon time. Alan's car was there, but Gordon's truck was nowhere to be seen. The lights were on in the kitchen, and the back door was unlocked. When I walked into the house, the warm, pungent smell of co coffee filled my nostrils. Thinking the two of them had gone to pick something up and would be right back, I settled into a chair. But after 15 minutes, I realized they had gone on without me. Must have forgotten I was coming. <laughs> So there I was, out in the country in the pitch black dark, with no idea how to get to a big George stick pond. Predictably, my bulldog personality convinced me that the thing to do was to try to find someone who was awake and get directions. I wasn't about to give up the drive home. Gordon's wife, Pat, was undoubtedly in the house, but I didn't feel like waking her up. Besides, she might not know where the stick pond was. <laughs> so I got in my car and started looking for a house with lights on. Before long, I spotted a small, very old, ramshackle house that had lights on inside. I had some reservations about going to the front door, but I persuaded myself that if I left my headlights on and the engine running, whoever was inside wouldn't feel threatened. Hoping for the best, I parked in the front and shuffled on with the rickety wooden porch. After a knock or two on the door, a man's voice from inside said, What do you want? Then the following dialogue went on, all through the closed front door. I'm trying to find the McGeorge stick pump. You can't miss it. <laughs> well, I missed it so far. <laughs> Can you tell me where to go? You turn left down there by the bungalow house. The what? The bungalow house down there by the sign. Thinking there was a sign that said McGeorge stick on it, I asked, what does the sign say? It used to say stop, but it don't say nothing. <laughs> <laughs> okay, once I turn left, how far is it? Not too far. <laughs> How far do you say it was? It ain't very far. <laughs> Exasperated, I thanked him and struck out for parts unknown. So there I was, looking for some sort of house at an intersection that had an unreadable sign at which I was to turn left and travel an unknown distance. <laughs> Simple. But sure enough, shortly I came to an intersection and my headlights illuminated a large, one-story wooden house with a screened-in front porch that I later found out was known locally as the Bungalow House. <laughs> and on the corner was a weathered red metal sign that undoubtedly used to say, Stop. I optimistically turned left, not knowing if I was going to travel a half mile or ten. The road was gravel, and I went about three miles before coming to a locked cable stretched across the road, blocking my vehicle. It was just beginning to get daylight, and I could see what looked like a levee a couple of hundred yards past the cable. Gathering up my fishing tackle, I stepped over the cable and walked toward the levee. Almost immediately, I came to an old red caboose off to the side of the road. Having grown up as an avid duck hunter, I had heard stories of McGeorge hunting parties using the caboose as a place to gather before the hunt. Thus, I 
was confident that I was at least on majority money. Once I climbed the levee, what was undoubtedly the majority stick pond lay in front of me. There were several trucks parked there, including Gordon's. Of course, Gordon and Albert were long gone, busily fishing away. It was after daylight now that I couldn't see any boats on the reservoir. Without much hope, I hollered for Gordon a few times to no avail. Then I realized that the reservoir had a large mowed levee all the way around it. If only the keys were in Gordon's truck, maybe I could find them. Sure enough, they were in the ignition, and after loading my fishing stuff in the back of the truck, I struck out after them. Of course, I could go either right or left, so on a whim, I went right. I hadn't gone but a few hundred yards when I spied them fishing in Gordon's boat. Success at last. <laughs> As I pulled up beside them, me on the levee, them down in the reservoir, I clearly heard Gordon say to Albert, hey, some SOB is driving my truck. <laughs> I leaned out the window and yelled, yeah, me. They both did a double take and Albert said, oh no, we left it. <laughs> they quickly pulled over to the bank and I joined them in the boat. They were practic practically hysterical with laughter when I told them all that had happened. Both had completely forgotten that I was to meet them. We had a great fishing trip catching a bunch of nice bass. And we told a few stories along the way. So there you have it, my quest to find the infamous Majora Stick Pine. And it would never have happened without the bungalow house. <laughs> <laughs>